Incoming transmission. Initiating data compilation protocol. Compilation complete. Enhanced. Enhanced. Initializing data playback. Code alpha. Begin playback. Welcome to episode two of the Big Giant Head podcast. I'm Matt, and I use this shaky platform to talk about my experiences developing Savage the Shard of Gosun and any other silly bits and pieces surrounding it that I want to talk about. If you don't like the cursing or the swears in general adult speak, this isn't a fun thing to listen to. Anyway, how's everybody doing? Don't answer that because I can't hear you. Uh, if you <laughs> if you want some actual interaction, uh, you can always catch me on Twitch where uh, I do develop uh, Savage the Shard of Gosen uh, in a live fashion every once in a while. Uh, except for this week. Well, I guess, yeah, that, that probably will bring us into the uh, our first little s- section here. The airing of the grievances, I guess, <laughs> is what is what I uh, am coming to call it. Because uh, last time, all I did was, was bitch, moan, and complain about shit. Uh, and I guess this will be no different. Um, I mean, I finally got my fat ass back to the gym, kind of, sort of. Um, I aggravated my stupid shin splints, uh, which are turning out to be more persistent than a freaking nest of cockroaches. That shit just won't go away, man. Um, but for the most part, there, you know, the, it's it's calmed down quite a bit. But it's when I try to do, uh, it's when I go into squat mode or something. Um, the next day, they kind of feel sort of weird again. And not, not in that, you know, like, yeah, I worked out my muscles. They feel good. They feel like they're repairing and getting stronger. Uh, it's the actual shin splint stuff, which uh, I've come to <laughs> I've, I've come to be quite familiar with. Um, but yeah, man, uh, allergies, <laughs> grievance number two. Uh, right now around here, it feels like living in a giant spore or something. And the poor cat, uh, too. He's he's allergic as well, and and he's been not feeling a hundred percent. Uh, and I don't think he will until we we move out of Austin, where just nothing dies, everything blooms. If it's not one thing, it's another. During winter, it's like freaking uh, cedar season, where people freaking flee the city for like a week. Uh, and then shortly after that, we got spring, where everything's just fucking deciding to come back to life and shedding its icky, yucky, disgusting bio crap everywhere. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, I, I just, I've just been feeling like last week too, like just been feeling like I have the flu or the cold or something. It's really obnoxious. Um, so work has been really slow because of that. And I've just been like lazy and crappy and in a fail mood in general. But yeah, every everything else is pretty good. It's just that stuff that's kind of annoying. Uh makes makes uh working up the energy to you know, to do stuff like this and to to do the the game de- developments uh kind of just blah. You just kind of want to sit around and and play Dark Souls, <laughs> which this weekend I decided to do. Uh and it was glorious. Absolutely glorious. Not not the first one, but the second one. And I know last time I was bitching and complaining about uh, about Dark Souls too, but I guess we can get into that in a second. But uh, yeah, I guess that kind of does it for life updates in general. The the airing of grievances. Um, ooh, I did I did. Uh, my buddy Tim, who's just like a wealth of of. Of knowledge. Every time I bring up something new that's kind of beneficial to my my work regimen and my day to day, usually comes from him. And uh, recently, turned me on to this thing called the uh, Work Rave. And I can't remember if I had talked about it last time or not. But um, so I guess if I did, we're going to crank the redundancy up to eleven. But Work Rave tracks your usage on your computer. 
um, and I guess it just does it through, you know, if you're, if you're, it detects input, I guess. So if you're using your mouse and your keyboard or, or any other peripheral, it, it will sort of count that as you're sitting here working. Uh, but what you can do is you can set up, uh, intervals of, uh, micro breaks and, and extended breaks. Uh, so the way I have mine set up is every 20 minutes, uh, after persistent use of the machine, Workrave pops up with a little notification saying like, hey, asshole, t take a take a micro break. And you can decide how long your micro breaks are. I, I uh, set mine at 60 seconds. Uh, and then every hour, I'll take a, a longer break. So every 20 minutes, uh, take a minute. And then every hour, I will get up for five minutes and do some stuff. And, uh, the extended breaks too, they, they have, uh, an option in there to do some, some sort of built-in exercises and the exercises appear to be random and they, they drop from like a pool and they, they'll, they'll have you do three of them. And some of them are, are finger exercises and some of them are like shoulder exercises and neck stretches. And they also have some eye exercises in there too, which I found kind of fascinating where, um, like for example, one of them, it tells you to, to focus on the upper left corner of your monitor and slowly trace uh, the contour of the thing or the, you know, the border of the monitor around uh, clockwise until you wind up back at the upper left corner. And then you reverse the direction and do that a couple times. Um, and it kind of walks you through these exercises with, <laughs> with a really derpy looking fricking uh, 3d model. It's not rendered like in 3d in like real time. It's, it's a pre-rendered <laughs> 3D model that looks like it came out of freaking like Bryce 1996 or something. It looks really weird um, and old, but but I mean it, it's it's serviceable. It's just there to show you how to do the little exercise that it's talking about. Um, so this is pretty funny. Uh, one thing I noticed about it though is it this thing is a fucking harsh bastard, man. Like it it locks your computer out. While while a while a break is is going on, if you, I I wonder if there's a toggle that you can tell it not to do that. But you you can also like skip your break, like you can just click a skip button and go about your business. But it's kind of nice to have that sort of stern taskmaster that's like, no, get up, move around, stretch, you know, whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of nice, and I I've been feeling a lot better too sitting here at the computer. Um, also, recently, um downstairs uh, and this is on a somewhat related note downstairs in our complex there's a in the mail room there's this this table that they have set up called the treasure table and people can go down there and and sort of you know offload whatever stuff they don't want anymore and it's kind of up for grabs like you just go down there if you see something you like you grab it and take it back upstairs with you or to your apartment or whatever uh but um recently i found uh this little back support thing and i forget what it's called hold on you're gonna you're gonna hear me sort of moving around here um it's called logic back and you can look it up on like amazon or something but uh and it's fairly priced it's like 60 bucks or, <laughs> or something i was kind of surprised uh and this thing is in in you know pretty good condition like it doesn't look really used at all or anything uh but what it is is it's a a little back support that you strap to your to your work chair or your office chair or anything and it and it supports your lower back um and and sort of forces you to engage your your core a little more while you're sitting there working so that was a really awesome find uh typically i don't really find anything down there that's interesting <laughs> usually it's really weird what people fucking leave down there too like i've i've seen like undergarments and shit uh people's like like panties and uh, fishnet stock. It's it's weird. And I'm like, what what is this? <laughs> where are we living? And and where is this stuff coming from? Uh, it feels like some kind of weird like boudoir thing. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. Most of the time, it's like really weird stuff that I'm like, no. And that probably smells weird. But this thing, hey, it didn't smell, and it serves a pretty important function. So score between that and work rave uh over the last couple of weeks have been feeling a lot better 
working here. I've also been doing uh, stretches that really help my shin splints, which has been helping a lot as well. And just general circulation. And uh, it's good for my legs because my legs have kind of poor circulation, especially when I'm sitting here like this, um, that I have discovered over the past few years working on this game full time. So yeah, man, important to get up and move around and, and, and take care of yourself. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Oh, another thing, uh, <laughs> that happened to me last week while I was tr uploading, uh, that first episode or actually, no, take a couple steps back here. Let's back it up. Uh, before I got a, a rendered version of this, of the first episode of this podcast, um, I was putting it together in HitFilm to produce a video file so that I could stick it on YouTube because I'm pretty sure these, these audio files are too large for me to just upload to uh to my site without like embedding it first, because there's a limit to the file size that you can upload uh, on a Squarespace site, I think it's 20 megabytes or something. But anyway, I've been using HitFilm to do little various video tasks and stuff because it's free. And I have just had the worst time with that program. <laughs> so their sort of message or their uh, mission, their mission statement is that it's supposed to be a platform to you to, for you to quickly produce uh, videos for the internet. Mostly that's the short of it anyway, I think, but, um, so it has a built-in YouTube exporter where you can link your YouTube account and you can click the export button and just go directly through YouTube and it'll upload your file to your uh, YouTube account and you'll have a brand new shiny video. You can even fill in the description and the tags uh, within HitFilm and all that stuff will, will be forwarded over to your YouTube account in your new video. I went ahead and tried that because every other time I've tried to produce video footage through HitFilm, it's always been just a huge pain in the ass. The interface is very clunky and slow especially if you're working with uh, 60 frames per second video like I have been with uh, footage from Savage uh, to give to the people that are working on the, uh, the live action trailer. And it's just, ugh, I, I don't even know. It's just the worst experience ever. Like things will get stuck in a, um, like a, just rendering forever like before you actually like export your video like if you drop in like media files and stuff it'll have the worst time uh you know rendering out that file or creating a proxy or whatever it is it does uh so that you can use it in the editor and the editor is really strange because you can't really do much with like uh you know automation like like uh fading in and out and using volume sliders and things like that. Like you have to go into the separate other editor to do composite shots. And then you create a composite shot from that. And then you can go back into your normal editor, your, your nonlinear editor and, and drop it in there or whatever. But if you have to make changes, you got to go like back and forth between these two interfaces. And it's very strange. I don't understand the workflow, but again, I'm not, you know, I'm not a hundred percent video guy. <laughs> So maybe maybe that sort of echoes uh, or parallels uh, what you know grown-up video editors do and their real-world <laughs> workflow, but it just doesn't work for me at all, and I hate it. And it hates sixty frames per second for some reason. But anyway, back to the point <laughs> with the first episode when I was trying to upload it. Um, it. Uh, I, th you know, this night it was just an image. All I all I wanted to do was overlay a freaking image, uh, static image, onto the audio file, and that's it. Um, also, it 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 seems that the only export option, if you're not going directly to YouTube, is just is an AVI file, and the file size is just freaking massive. <laughs> like, for example, that first episode when I rendered out a version of it, it turned out to be like 400 gigs or something. So it's, it's funny when the thing that you output is way bigger than the assets that you're using to create the thing. Right. Um, 
so and that's the only that's the only really uh uh that's the only option for rendering aside from exporting to YouTube. But anyway, uh it took me several tries to export to YouTube and by several failed attempts <laughs> and it took like all freaking day so my my PC was just, you know, in render mode and it's it's pretty useless. Uh, when you're doing that, so, and it, you know, you can you can wind up messing up your uh, your output that way if you're if you're fiddling with other crap. At least on my machine, my machine is not really, you know, a titan. <laughs> it's not a beast. Uh, it's it's running on uh, almost six years old now. But uh, so I don't know. Maybe that's the problem too. It could be just my rig. Uh, Hitfilm maybe doesn't like my rig, but I think Hitfilm's largely built with with mac os 10 in mind and later but anyway um first time i tried to upload to youtube i it failed but only, it only failed after of course you know three or four hours of rendering <laughs> and then try again tells me that the upload succeeded so i'm like yay cool awesome so i i check it on youtube and uh you know, YouTube has to process it and all that, so I'm, I'm sitting there waiting, doing some other stuff, getting some <laughs> getting some Dark Souls 2 in while I'm waiting. Uh, finally, it goes live, and but then I notice that the video is only 46 minutes long, where the actual output uh, is supposed to be like an hour and 39 minutes or something like that. So I'm like, what the fuck? So I, uh, you know, I s skip to the end of the video, and there's just this weird uh, static the image is all corrupt and it's all messed up and the audio is weird. And I'm like, Oh geez. So there's like a, a remaining five minutes that are just, is just no man's land. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fuck with the YouTube exporter that hit film is supposed to supposedly supposed to have been built for. What is it with these fucking services? Ah, that have built in YouTube exporters like Twitch is that way too, where if you're, if you're live streaming, you can take your archive stream and export it to YouTube, but like, it seems like 75% of the time it fails. <laughs> so I don't know, man. But anyway, um, what was I talking about again? Hit film. Yeah. So I decided to just export straight to AVI, you know, just export to my desktop, whatever, just render it to my desktop and I'll have my video file. And then from there <laughs> I can take the video file and freaking compress it into like an mp4 or something something more manageable that's not 400 gigs um so i do that and then i use handbrake to uh to uh uh what's the word you know change ch uh, go from format to format and uh so i do that and then I wind up with the same problem where uh, a hit film rendered out this useless video file that cut off like the last half of the of the uh, podcast. So it's just, <laughs> it's just, you know, this takes like a day and a half. Like this is over the course of, you know, it takes hours and hours to do this. You know, every step takes a few hours to to get to the end and realize, oh, it failed. <laughs> so... So I just bit the bullet and and I went back to Sony Vegas because and and guess what Sony Vegas first time boom done took a couple hours to render it out but it it was fine it worked everything was glorious uh I was able to set up my own uh you know export options and uh so I can export to to I have a like a, a YouTube template now that I can just export to um that's optimized for for the web and all that crap uh and and I was able to just freaking fade in the image, you know, add a, add a little transition at the beginning, like just piece of cake, easy. Uh, and the the interface is totally smooth and just yeah, totally worth it, but uh, very expensive. <laughs> so, but it's worth it. It's gonna be it saves if it if it can save a freaking day and a half every time I want to do one of these damn things, because that's not. You know, that's that's not an option. Like, you can't just cut out a freaking, um, you know, 25% of my week 
every time I want to uh, do one of these things and render it out to a video file and upload it. Just not happening. So uh, in the end, <laughs> in stress and headaches, uh, Sony Vegas wins. <laughs> It'll totally make up for it. So anyway, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what's been going on. Uh, what, what have, what have I been playing lately? Not much outside of Dark Souls 2. When I haven't been working, been playing Dark Souls 2. I got in, I got in a lot of Dark Souls 2 time, uh, waiting on that shit to render out and, you know, all that hit film crap. Um, so that was kind of a nice excuse to, to be like, well, I can't use my computer right now. I guess I'll go play some Dark Souls. Um, and last time, last time on Big Giant Head, uh, I was I was doing a lot of crying about Dark Souls 2 and how it was different and blah blah blah. Um and I got to say the first the first area of Dark Souls 2 that you go through is kind of bullshit. Uh there's a lot of ridiculous crap in there that's thrown at you like right away. I found the the later the later areas to be a lot more forgiving. <laughs> in a lot of ways like you I w I talked a lot about uh telegraphing through through level design and stuff. And the later areas kind of kind of do that. You you can kind of see what's coming and and after you go through the f f fucking gauntlet that is the first area uh which is forest of fallen giants um and it's all it's all like man-sized enemies and stuff and they they do their little man-sized attacks and and everything and but they're very unpredictable the the hollow soldiers and your standard undead soldiers and stuff. They're just very unpredictable, and they they have a few a handful of moves that have no telegraph or no tells, so all of a sudden you're just struck out of nowhere. Um, but the later enemies are, are, are a little easier to read, and a lot of them don't necessarily have those kind of little bullshit maneuvers, and the placing of the enemies is a lot easier to figure out. So around the mid game, I was starting to have a lot more fun with it, and and then I I felt that pull again. The okay, now I now I remember why I'm playing this, <laughs> and and some of the changes too that I that I'd been bitching about, I got used to. I got used to the way uh, the move, slight ver changes to the movement work, and uh, parrying is a lot harder in this one. I gotta say, uh, setting up and timing a parry. Uh, feels really weird i will say one thing though dark souls 2 has taught me a lot more about iframes invincibility frames so there's you know the the period there's a period in your dodge animation where you're untouchable and those are your invincibility frames and dark souls 2 has taught me a lot more about that so i do appreciate that there's a lot more emphasis it seems like maybe this is just my play style but it seems like there's a lot more emphasis on dodging as opposed to attempting to parry or backstab and stuff like that. Uh, and, and utilizing your dodge correctly, you can set up a lot more instances where you can get a, a backstab critical strike in. So, uh, but yeah, that aside, um, I did beat it the other morning. Felt fucking awesome. The boss was very easy, actually. Uh, when I stopped, when I stopped freaking summoning NPCs to try to help me in the fight uh, against uh, Nashandra, I think she's called the final boss of the game, uh, I was actually able to solo her, and it was a lot easier. I think when I summon NPCs and other players to help me fight a boss, I tend to get very distracted with what's going on. Everybody's moving around all over the place, and, and you can accidentally sort of bump into each other, and uh, other players' hitboxes are impassable. Like, if you if you... You know, if you if you, you can actually accidentally dodge into another person and it, and that kills your momentum. Uh, if you're trying to strafe, um, you can bump into another person and you know you can't you can't go through them, can't pass them, which is that's fine. But I found that to be very distracting. I think I I would bet that Dark Souls Two would be a lot easier for me if I soloed a lot of the bosses. A lot of the main bosses too. There are like four main bosses. You have to get the 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 four main souls in the game or the great souls, I guess they're called from these four bosses. And those guys were kind of a piece of cake compared to some of the other ones is mostly is mostly the fricking, uh, the group bosses that gave me a headache. There are a lot of bosses in dark souls too, where, 
uh, they're very mobbish. Like, um, especially the gargoyle fight. Like, they kind of recycle the gargoyle fight from the first game. But instead of two gargoyles, there's like six of them. And I've already talked about how Dark Souls games are rubbish at group fighting. If you're using the lock-on mechanic anyway. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the bosses were very easy. Uh, I didn't think that a lot of the bosses were as exciting as in the first game. There's some cool ones, though. I did like the Rotten. He was neat looking. Um, also, the 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 god of song i think he's called he's a he's this giant frog monster with a with a face in his mouth and arms he's neat um but yeah i i actually want to play it through again i want to give it another go um so we'll see man i do, i do this is episode two and i i feel like 90 percent of the content between this one and the last one has been dark souls shit uh in keeping with the festivus theme uh, probably just fucking call this segment Estus for the rest of us. Um, cause I do so much fucking Dark Souls talk, but uh, but they're such interesting games, especially from a design standpoint. Everything is intertwined with everything else. Uh, you know, it's um, you see, you have a lot of games, especially now, like take Assassin's Creed for example. Uh, you know, they have a sort of co-op mode. Or or versus modes that are very feel very separate from the main game, which that's that's like ninety nine percent of of video games, right? They have like a like a an arena mode or a or a versus mode or some kind of co op mode, or that you know the single player experience is kind of designed to have another person with you, like you know with Halo games and shit, where it's like yeah somebody can just drop in and and shoot bad guys with you and you just kind of go through the game. But Dark Souls has so many different layers of co-op and PvP built within it. Like, even the messaging system, right? Like, people can leave messages, and you can read the messages, and you can view people's bloodstains and sort of figure out, like, piece together how they died while watching a short little animation of of their, of a, like, a specter of their character biting the dust. So all of those, like, the messaging system and, and viewing other people's bloodstains... Is, is kind of a version of co-op. It's like co-op light or something. And uh, some of those messages could also be like mild PvP, right? Like people kind of goading you into jumping off a cliff or something. Uh, and then other people will try to counter it with, you know, leaving a message like, beware of liar and shit like that. So it's, there's, it's really just interesting even on a very basic level. And then you start to get into the actual gameplay where you can summon people and... But uh, it's very high risk to summon people because you have to be in a, a very invadable state, at least in the first one. Um, but it's just fascinating to me that they're able to make it all work. Uh, and, and you're just playing the game. Like, you're just going through the actual meat of the game. But if you want to stop and actually get hardcore into PvP, that's there for you, too. And then there are also coven covenants, which are kind of like the factions in the game, that are hardcore co-op. Like, that's their whole purpose is just to help other players. And I guess you gain rewards for doing that. I haven't really uh, traveled too deep into the Covenant system, but I bet... And so, the, yeah, that's just a whole other layer of the game, and it all exists within sort of the critical path of the game, which is incredible to me. Like, there isn't, there really isn't anything else like these games going on right now, I feel like, anyway. But then maybe, there, maybe there are. Maybe, maybe in, like, the super-duper underground development scene there are games that sort of have have exhibit those traits i don't know maybe there are but anyway yeah just lots of lots of really smart and intelligent design philosophies going on um dark souls 2 maybe to a lesser extent in certain situations and in other areas more so like i said like i kind of like uh that you're sort of forced in dark souls 2 to take on enemies uh you know, face to face a little more like the the sur strafing around and backstabbing doesn't <laughs> doesn't exploit exploity gameplay style doesn't really fly in Dark Souls 2. You kind of have to go toe to toe a lot more. Uh but uh yeah, still I mean there's still things that really bother me about the game like certain enemies uh resetting their animations and not seeming to really rely on any stamina or anything. Like they just kind of go batshit on you and it that can be pretty unfair and stupid. <laughs> 
<laughs> but and the and the the group fights, group fights and group ambushes. That game has plenty of them. So that those and the exploding barrels <laughs> of of the Lost Bastille are just horseshit <laughs> in my opinion. But uh but yeah, I I I kind of dug it and I I really like the uh the varied environments in the game. I know that a lot of people complain about how the environments don't really work together. Excuse me. Allergies. But uh because they don't really adhere to to a lot of visual continuity from area to area, they can kind of go nuts where it's like, "Hey, we're in a windmill right now. Now we're going to take an elevator up a few floors and all of a sudden you're in crazy uh lava town." <laughs> Which doesn't make sense, but visually, uh, it's a very striking contrast to where you just were. So there's there's a lot of uh, visual variety in the actual uh, areas in Dark Souls 2, which I like a lot. So yeah, Dark Souls, super excited about the third one. I gotta rein it in, though, because I've been playing too many fucking Dark Souls video games and not doing enough work. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I've been using I've been using my allergies and and shit like that as kind of my my crutch over the last week, last two weeks really to be like I don't feel good. I'm gonna play hooky and and play some Dark Souls. You know, do a few hours of animation and then go be like I want to take a Dark Souls break. Uh, but I don't know, man. Sometimes I feel like I need to cocoon a little bit before I do a big crazy push again on the game and you know work pull my hundred hour weeks and shit. Um. So yeah, not not been very proud of my productivity the last couple of weeks. Um, so I've been yeah. Now the guilt is starting to set in, where I'm just like, ah, oh, fuck, man. I could have gotten so much work done, but instead I was killing zombies in the fucking lava town <laughs> or wherever. But uh, yeah. So um, speaking of playing video games and such. Hyperlight Drifter came out uh, on the thirty first, and I and I did pick it up because I mean I'm I'm fucking curious, man. Like I want to know what for a while was kind of uh, the flagship game for especially like Yo Yo Games Game Maker. Like uh, they were promoting that game like crazy for the first uh, few months, or at least it seemed like it. And uh, as they should, because it looked freaking gorgeous, man. Uh, if anybody is going to get excited about your development platform, it's going to be, you know, through watching things get made like Hyperlight Drifter and Risk of Rain and Hotline Miami and stuff like that. So I was very interested to take a look at it. And uh, and it feels pretty good. Like uh, when you when you get into the combat in Hyperlight Drifter, you get into a to a kind of groove, a rhythm that feels pretty, pretty neat, uh, with the, with the dashing mechanic and the, and your little, uh, sword laser sword combo that you can do on the bad guys. Um, but, oh my God, it's difficult. <laughs> uh, between, between points on your critical path, like between your A and your B, um, you, there's, it seemed like there's a lot of traversal of sort of, foresty type areas so you got a lot of canopy right there's a lot of leaves and shit uh that eclipse your player as you're going through uh and bad guys love to fucking jump out of those areas and sometimes they're already in a like a strike animation so you got to be really you got to be kind of like finger on the trigger you got to have your thumb ready to go on the a button which is your <laughs> which is your d dodge dash kind of button it also like doubles as kind of your jump sort of when you're doing sort of platforming uh but uh there are things about it that are like well eh. there, there are a lot of situations too where you get boxed in into a like a little arena sort of s situation where they throw waves and waves of enemies at you and i feel like some of those waves are just <laughs> one or two waves too many like it'll start with some melee guys that'll jump out at you and your mind you're boxed in right you can't leave this the screen or whatever the doors are shut the way is shut. You will go no further. It's it's you gotta fight or die. Um, so it'll start out with like some some melee guys or something. You kill them, like three of them maybe, and then like two ranged dudes will spawn. You kill them, and then maybe a larger 
enemy that has a ranged attack, like a multi-ranged attack, usually something that uh, heat seeks, like heat seeking projectiles uh, will fire in waves from him. And he's got, he's a bit juicier. He's got more hit points. So you kill him. And then a, like a fourth wave will spawn of like maybe, maybe some melee dudes and maybe some ranged dudes. So you kill them. And then a fifth wave will spawn with like everybody that that wave has introduced you to. You're like, okay, cool. And then a final one <laughs> will, will spawn with like more of everything. And it's just like, and you, your health is very limited, at least uh, as far as I can tell. You have maybe five hit points. And they'll they'll wear you down eventually. So it's it's almost like it loves to kind of throw that uh the final straw, you know, the the straw that breaks the camel's back at you, like right at the end. Um But again, all you, you kinda have the you have the tools to deal with it. But you gotta be on your in the zone, man. You gotta be on your A game to to survive these situations. I have not made it to a boss. Okay, so here's here's the thing. I played half an hour of it, and I got kind of sick. I, I felt like I got kind of motion. I never get motion sickness in games. Like, I can play any 3D game just fine. Um, but I something about the camera was making me feel a little weird. Uh, and I, I think it's in combination with the... Uh, it has a, a lazy cam or kind of a floaty cam, like it will, the camera will slowly reposition itself based on where you're moving and where you're facing and stuff like that, uh, which which is fine. It's not, That's sometimes more acceptable than a very binary camera. You know, it's either like it's following your guy and it's like locked in and it's always, you know, the view is always centered on your character. Uh, it can kind of, it can feel better in a lot of instances where you do have that sort of floaty variable cam camera. Um but in this case, like that coupled with the uh, with the visual design of the game, like there's a lot of pastels and neons and stuff, and I think I was kind of getting getting a little a little bit of a headache and a little tiny bit nauseous. Also, I didn't realize the game is locked at 30 frames per second. Um, and this is this could be a whole discussion where I I don't I just don't buy the arguments for 30 frames per second. Unless like your game is really suffering, uh, and it needs to tone the frame rate down or something, but um, I think, yeah, but I think the camera and the the visuals and the thirty frames per second was contributing to my sort of headache. <laughs> um, so I looked on Steam and I saw that there were a lot of threads that uh, started by people that seemed to have the same problems as I did. And there was even one guy who was like, "Yeah, I can only play for th- half an hour," and I started to feel sick. Um, but when it's when it's locked at thirty frames per second like that, you kind of notice, uh, especially in a pixel art game, you notice the 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 slight movements. You know, it looks more jittery because everything's at an angle and everything's squares and shit. Like you can kind of see where the camera just moved four pixels or whatever to the left or to the right or up or down. Uh, it's a lot more apparent. Uh, and it's a much less smoother experience. I saw this video where a guy uh, took the Hyperlight Drifter trailer and interpolated a bunch of frames so that it ran at 60, the video. And it was way better. I, I was watching, I was like, okay, this is, the game is way easier to read now. Uh, and I, I remember having that problem in Savage, too. Like, I was just... Because when you make a when you create a room asset in Game Maker, and rooms are where you know the meat of your game happens, uh, by default it's set at thirty frames per second or thirty steps, as Game Maker calls it. So you have steps per frame, and when you create a room, the default is thirty. Uh, for a long time, I was working on Savage at thirty, and I, you know, I didn't know any better, and then I. Um, just through general reading and experimenting and stuff, I, I I tried setting it to 60. And holy shit, what a difference. The game felt way better. Way smoother. People, A lot of people like to make the argument that like uh, running a, an action game, especially a high-octane action game like Hyperlight Drifter. And this has been made for, for Nuclear Throne too, which... Uh, which um, 
that game is hard for me to look at too. And now I know why. I didn't realize that Nuclear Throne ran at 30 frames per second either. And there's so much shit going on in that game that it can be kind of jittery looking. Uh, but anyway, um, people like to say that, you know, oh, consoles are always running at 30 frames per second. They have for forever. Uh, and I don't know the the super technical stuff, but just like play Zelda 2 and uh, tell me that that isn't smoother, you know? Um, there are plenty of NES games that, that, that feel like they're running at a higher frame rate than 30. But again, those are analog signals, so you can't really... And also, NES games usually didn't use a... What is it? Delta time, I guess, where where the game can sort of compensate for if it's if it's got any slowdown and it's running at a, a lower frame rate. But NES games would just slow down. <laughs> it's almost like they went into bullet time or something when too much shit was being drawn on the screen. But uh, yeah, I've, I mean, I've heard the argument that like a lower frame rate allows you to calculate the distance in pixels between, you know, like say, you know, Simon Belmont and his whip and where an enemy is. And it's like, no, fuck, that's just bullshit, man. The smoother your experience, I feel, the easier it is for you to react to things. You have you have more frames to work within, um, to, you know, without getting too mathy with it or too technical. Um, in general, for for a, a white knuckle action game, I, I kind of feel like sixty is just better, um, and that's just my opinion and based on my experience as well, especially my experience with Hyper Light Drifter. Uh, you know, getting a little nauseous <laughs> while looking at it but i mean i was playing it on uh our larger tv screen in our living room and i i tried it again on my uh, uh once i got sick i was just like i can't do this i i got a refund on steam um but uh, i decided to just try it again to pick it up again you know, I, I was being very wishy-washy with it. I was like, I don't know. All right. Uh, so I got it again and, and tried it on my computer screen, and it felt a lot better. I, I feel like my eyes were able to manage what was coming at me a little, <laughs> a little, uh, just a little better. For whatever reason, uh, my my PC screen was just a little more serviceable for that game. Uh, so I don't know. Who knows? There, there are other weird things about the game too that I, I don't know if I qu quite like. I okay, so the the story is delivered in images only. There's no text. You're never really sure what you are or what you're doing or how you got where you are or why you're sick. If you're coughing up blood and everything. Um, things are delivered in a very visual, or organic way, I guess. Uh, but it doesn't tell you what your story is. I'm fine with lore being vague, with the mythology of the game world being vague and you kind of having to piece it together as you go. But I think a story is best served uh, with precision, right? Uh, like my friend and I were talking about this yesterday. Like, look at The Thing, the movie The Thing. Um, the story, like just the basic story is like, you know, an alien is killing these dudes and it can turn into them, and they have to survive. And that's it. That's the thing. But it's got this whole underlying thing that's not really that important to the story, but sweetens it, makes it taste better, <laughs> that uh, a ship crashed on planet Earth thousands of years ago, and this thing's been living in the ice, and uh, you don't know if the thing maybe like commandeered another species on that ship, and that's why it crashed. And... You know, started to transform into those things, and and now it just wants either to get off world and repair its ship, or to continue, uh, you know, conquering planet Earth or something. We don't know why it's there or anything. And there's there are a lot of sort of visual clues and things, and and the dudes uh, on in the uh, at the facility are kind of trying to understand it too. They don't know, um, but there's there's yeah, there's a lot of interesting things going on beneath the main story that's you know it's vague we're never really told 100 percent what's going on but the you know the the story story is just that these dudes are fighting this alien thing and they have to survive and that's it another good example is like blade runner 
the story of Blade Runner is that, you know, there are these murdering robots, <laughs> psychopath robots uh, that have escaped. And there is a special cop that his job is to hunt them down and kill him. And that's it. Guy fighting robots. But there's like a a whole wealth of subtext in that film. A whole, you know, a whole, a whole uh, batch of lore underneath all of that. You know, they, they talk about like, the, I mean, the whole central theme is like, do, do machines have souls? And what is a soul? And what makes someone human? And what, why would an AI construct be less human uh, than a human? And all that shit. And like, is Deckard a replicant himself? You know, he has the dream about the unicorn and the, uh, his, his colleague cr makes the little, uh, origami unicorn as if he knows or something, you know? Uh, and you see the way Deckard's eyes, uh, react to light and the replicants have the same effect with their eyes and the light. It, there's just a whole bunch of shit, you know, and it, we don't really need to know uh, all of that with a, the motivation of the plot is just that he's a cop and he's got to retire these replicants. He's got to to end them. So in Hyperlight Drifter, you kind of don't really have a whole lot of motivation for for where you're going and what you're trying to do because you don't know what you need or what you want or you know it looks like you're kind of maybe dying, but you don't know if you caused this weird sort of cataclysm that happens at the beginning of the game. Like maybe you're a, a bad element. Or maybe you were there when it happened and it you survived somehow. And I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe it all explains itself at the end. But the problem is you don't have that narrative push, that narrative motivation to get you to the end. For me, anyway. That's just my take on it. And there's a whole bunch of other weird stuff, too. Like, to upgrade your character, it's like you're not really grinding. Like you're, It doesn't appear like the enemies drop currency or anything. You kind of have to find these little bits of currency. At least that's what I think they are. Again, the game doesn't tell you anything. It just sort of shows you pictures of things. So you have to piece it together. And it doesn't help that the game is this weird alien thing, <laughs> right? Like, the game takes place on a totally made-up... It's it's not like traditional European fantasy. It's not, you know, uh, Asian. It's not... Uh, your standard spaceships and laser gun stuff. It's some somewhere in between and it's totally made up and you know, th there aren't any really lo human looking things in it. It's a bunch of weird animal people. And so it doesn't help that there's already this obscure layer to the, to the design. Uh, so there's, there's not a whole lot of relatability. <laughs> so, but uh, again, like the, the, the core game feels pretty good. Like when you're actually fighting, feels interesting uh the exploration to me felt a little weak i the long game as i saw one person put it uh there's your short game which is your you know your your little uh arena based fight sequences and then the long game which is you trying to find pieces that will create a currency <laughs> that you can use to upgrade certain things See, I don't even know how to explain it because nothing is called anything. So there's no, we don't have a language for it, right? <laughs> there's no way to kind of describe things. I mean, you can describe them, but you can't call them anything because they don't have a name. At least none that is revealed to the player through text or, any, or like, you know, there's no, yeah, there's just none of that. It's, it's, but that is pretty damn interesting to me that this exists and that they decided to take it the way that they did. I think it's a really neat experiment, but uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, I've been reading stuff where like people are getting stuck in these arena fights because what happens is uh, you, there are points in the game that auto saves and it will save like your, your item state and your character state when you pass through these invisible checkpoints. Uh, so if you die and respawn, you have the this, the amount of life you had, the amount of health packs you had, the amount of bullets you had uh, when, when you hit that checkpoint. So if you hit a checkpoint and you have one health, say, and no health packs and, like, no ammo for your gun, but you, you can get ammo by slashing things. Like, that kind of recharges your pistol. But uh, let's say that happens and, you're, and you are 
you respawn you're respawning in one of those areas where the the doors lock on you you're kind of stuck with just that one health getting through these waves of bad guys uh so <laughs> you're kind of fucked but i i think you can get out of that situation if you warp back to your central hub you you unlock these sort of warp areas that um that at any point you can bring up your map and and teleport back to but you're teleporting back to the game so that you back to the very fucking beginning of the game so that you can re up on your health packs and recharge your health and stuff so you got to make your make the trek all the way back to where you were having that issue so th- there are things like that I mean, I mean you know and that's probably the the kind of game they wanted to make right they wanted to make this very challenging punishing uh ness hard kind of game but uh I, I suspect a little bit of artificial difficulty there, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so that's kind of a bummer. I was hoping for, for something a little different, but, I mean, that might not be fair, but there it is. Um, I, I want to give it another go this time on my, on my, my smaller computer monitor and, and sort of play around with it and see how far I can get and see if things kind of change a little bit and there there are that's not to say that there's nothing engaging about it it's it's pretty neat to to run into the the character that saves you at least i guess he saves you at the beginning of the game it's neat to run into him again again i don't know or her it's a person in a in power armor with a cape like a a cyber knight (laughs) kind of kind of looking dude or dudette um and they want something too, and I don't know what it is exactly though, and I don't know if you're working together or whatever. Who knows? It's it's really hard to tell with that game. But uh but yeah, the the combat's pretty fun once you once you get into the groove of it. Um and it's gorgeous, man. The the animations are fucking beautiful. Especially the intro sequence. It felt very another world or out of this world, or like games like Flashback. Which I was pretty impressed by, and I wasn't expecting either. I uh, seeing fully animated sort of sequences um, it was really neat. So yeah, I, I I do look forward to giving it another go. The, the combat is 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 satisfying enough. It's very punchy. You, if you listen to the last podcast, you know I'm big on punchy combat. I'm good. I'm big on uh, good feedback in in melee combat and even ranged combat too. Um, if a game is combat centric, it's got to have good feedback for me and hyperlight drifter definitely does oh another thing that i really like about it is the 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 gui or the the user interface uh just just when you're scrolling through the options and stuff everything feels really nice and that's something that i'm i'm paying a lot of attention to excuse me uh in games because i'm gonna have to cross that threshold as well where Savage does have a user interface, you know, you can access your items and you can uh, use items and, and read descriptions and all that stuff, but it doesn't feel 100% yet. Also, it's very ugly in Savage, so <laughs> that's that's something that I that I have been paying close attention to, especially in Hyperlight Drifter, because they do it so well. It's got a lot of juice, as they say, in the user interface. Uh, it feels great to scroll through options. It feels great when you push a button. It's got a lot of nice, juicy feedback in there, and just visually, it's communicated very well and very elegantly. And it's just a nice, it's a nice experience. So, um, yeah, Hyperlight Drifter, gonna give it another shot. So, what the hell have I been working on in Savage: The Shard of Gosen when I'm not bitching about allergies and when I'm not retreating to my Dark Souls Two uh, comfort blanket? My my warm milk, that is Dark Souls too. Uh, <laughs> um, but no longer because you know I beat it, so I gotta suck it up. Get back to work, man. Get back to work because this game ain't gonna finish itself. Savage: The Shard of Gosen, if you don't know, is a 2D action platformer that I've been developing and working on full time since uh, since the beginning of 2014. Uh, ever since, ever since, uh, late 2013, early 2014, when I when I decided to do a Kickstarter for it, um, it's about barbarians, and uh, you play a little barbarian dude. It's like it's essentially Conan the Barbarian meets Zelda 2. So it's very it's melee centric. 
uh, so I, that's why I, <laughs> I talk a lot on here about, uh, melee and, and feedback and punchy melee and all that stuff. Uh, but I'm, I'm in animation hell right now, which is not good for my morale. I've got to admit, um, and discipline is not my strongest suit, but, uh, that's, <laughs> that's very important when you're working on, uh, characters that are highly articulate like this particular boss that i'm working on so i've never been big on keyframe animation i usually animate forward which i think lends kind of a a, a more interesting look to things like i think uh most especially most pixel art games uh, are are key people animate those keyframe use keyframes to animate um and uh, lately things have been looking kind of homogenize <laughs> to me. There are very similar looks and styles anymore to uh, to a lot of pixel art games, and I think I'm trying to stray away from that as much as I can, just to just to give Savage somewhat of a a more unique visual identity. Um, but yeah, mostly it's also because I suck, and I'm I'm not a trained professional animator, so I for a long time I d I didn't even know about keyframes. Um, I think just sort of organically, I arrived at the solution of keyframing out uh, sequences out of necessity for certain things, like big giant monsters and stuff. Uh, it's helpful to have uh, some keyframes sometimes, but most of the time, I, I just kind of do it forward. Uh, I just go frame by frame and uh, and then tweak things until it looks okay for me. But uh, that can be kind of hell. When you're when you're animating a especially a character that has a large move set and has a lot of layers, right now I'm going through a lot of uh, the remaining sort of humanoid enemies and bosses that still need to get done, and especially in boss territory they have a lot of layers. This one in particular, uh, Trot about the the mother of bears boss. She's kind of a, a bigger like She Hulk looking character, uh, barbarian type that has a, uh, you know, she's got like a lot of like cl uh, furs on and stuff and, and bracers and like a helmet that can be removed and a, and a, and a hair layer. That's, that's also pretty articulate. Like it reacts a lot to her movements and stuff. So when you have 30 freaking layers that you got to pay attention to, and I keep things separate on layers for consistency's sake. Um, Sometimes it's just easier to sort of move things around and be lazy about it than to redraw an arm or some, you know, arm, head, body, every single damn frame. It's sometimes it's easier to just manipulate them and squash and stretch or, or rotate and then clean it up that way. Um, especially with a, with a boss like this that has a ton of moves. Like she's got several different attacks, um, that she can do. She's got like a, like a, a spear thrust type attack that can go over the player's head if he's if he ducks. Uh, she's got a big giant swing that she can do, like an overhand swing. And then another overhand swing, but it comes from the air. Like she'll she'll do a leap, a leaping attack, and uh, she'll pause on a frame when she hits the frame and she, if she's in midair. And then when she hits the ground, then she'll go into her big slam attack. And uh, she can also throw spears as well. So she's... You know, in addition to all of the all of the things that the game requires for any enemy, like the enemy has to be able to be stunned most of the time. The enemy needs to be able to die, and if I want to get really saucy with it, I give them an extra death animation, like for for decapitations and stuff like that, because it's very satisfying when you when you score a decapitation, <laughs> it's, and the head bounces around and you get extra blood particles and stuff. It's reactive. It's got some punch. It's got that's that's a, a form of release, I think, that really benefits the game is is uh, getting your cool death animations. That's sort of a somewhat long. If you're if you're looking at uh you know point A and a point B being a fight sequence with a particular enemy, uh, the long form release is the death animation, and the long form tension is the 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 whole fight. You know, you have your your little tension and release moments in there like you know pulling back on a weapon and striking is is your 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 player related tension and if you actually hit the enemy and you get a couple blood particles 
and then the the red flash and the uh, the audio cue that you actually hit the enemy and did damage, and you see the little number pop out. That's a form of uh, release as well. So I'm I'm animating this character uh, with those things in mind. I mean, she's she's got to have good tells too. She's got to have good tension in her tells and a release once the the weapon strikes because you can have tension and release when you're playing evasively as well like if your dodge feels good that's a form of release um the tension comes in in the danger of the strike and then and then the release when you either dodge out of the way or or avoid it either just by running away or or whatever using your iframes <laughs> i'm big on iframes now for sure um and this was even before i i, I had this crazy dark souls erection um it just seemed appropriate to give the player uh, invincibility frames while he's doing a dodge roll or a like a back dodge like you know a la like castlevania symphony of the night i don't know if there are invincibility frames in, in that game but i gave them to the player in savage just the same because it's just a little more interesting to me um but yeah <laughs> this boss is killing me right now man and before this too like one of the one of the uh, uh, I think the last boss I did before this one was also a man-sized boss, and that was the Gizmotan boss, who's kind of a, a crazy chaos warrior. No, I'm sorry, chaos wizard. He's a an insane sorcerer type. Uh, and just, I think I get very fatigued when I have to deal with clothing layers and, uh, like, I'm, if I'm paper dolling the thing, you know, uh, laying on the clothing layers and stuff. And he had a he had a cape too. He had a big, sort of flowy, reactive cape that I was animating on top of all that, that man killed my morale. <laughs> and, and this character kind of is too, because I made her complicated. Like I gave her, uh, like blue tattoos, you know, kind of woad style tattoos, uh, or s sort of like Devada from weapon Lord, who has just a fucking awesome, uh, visual design. Uh, so she has, yeah, she's got like the war painty looking tattoos on her like Braveheart looking tattoos. So uh, those have to be drawn over the new animation as well. Um, you know, however many frames, like for just for her main attack animation, like the big overhand swing, uh, she's got like 20 frames of animation or so. So you can imagine like animating the body parts and then animating the weapon, making sure it looks good through its swing, which is hard to do in pixel art. Um, at such a low resolution, like you can make things look very junky and, and have a lot of jaggies they're called make something look very jagged and unnatural. Uh, if you're not paying attention, <laughs> um, especially when you color the thing too, you can run on all kinds of visual issues that just make the thing look ugly, which I have been trying to combat since day one because I am no professional. <laughs> so it's a lot of stubbing of the toes and figuring out what works and, but she's coming together pretty good. Um, she's almost done. Her animation set is almost done. And I can finally get to the nitty gritty of actually uh, working on her artificial intelligence and stuff. And then after that, most of the bosses are finished. I have the main boss that's a necessity. He needs to get done. But after that, like, that's a boss milestone. All of the core bosses are finished. I, I Obviously, I have like a backlog of... <laughs> of uh bosses that are on my wish list but i don't know how many of those are going to happen if we're going to get this done, game done in a timely fashion i i estimate that i've got about 1300 hours of work left and i'm trying to work through as much of that as i can between now and the summer which is when i'd like to be mostly finished have something that i can play through start to finish and because I've got a lot of stage design left too, man. Like I'm about a fifth of the way done with the actual, you know, what I could call a finished sequence that you can play through 100%. Minus uh, polish and stuff like that. That's I'm gonna have to do a polish and balance pass uh, later on. But um, as far as uh, getting to the point where the game can hit, I can confidently say, okay, it's in beta now. Like everything's locked in. Now it's just about fine tuning and balance and polish. Uh, I've got about 1300 hours left. So I got to kind of put the pedal to the metal, man. Put down your dark souls, asshole. 
you put down your Dark Souls as your Hyperlight Drifter and fucking work. Um. So yeah, I mean these these podcasts really help because it's it's like me <laughs> venting to you, poor souls, <laughs> you 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 two or three listeners uh, who are so patient and so kind and so good for listening. But um, but yeah, man. Uh, after a- okay, so after she's done, I've got maybe two or three more animations that still need to happen for her. I need I need to do her death sequences. Um. And I need to do her spear throw as well. She's still got to do her spear throw because um, I am sorely lacking in the the ranged character department and also the air based enemies too. Like I don't have a lot of air based stuff and I don't have a lot of ranged uh, bad guys. Though recently I did I did finish dropping in the uh, the old rock biter, where if if you've played the uh, the old public alpha of the game, the rock biters were those sort of wall crawling insects that had spikes on their backs, and they could spit acid. So those are back in the game, and they uh, just the fact that they can sort of crawl on walls and ceilings and stuff, um, and then spit acid either while they're facing the player, if they're on the same plane as the player, and they, they can spit acid at you. And they can also spit it at you if they're above you. So uh, last podcast I was talking about um, how I have a lot of <laughs> non- platformer friendly enemies you know enemies that sort of double as a hazard you know like a a a predictable hazard you know maybe they're static and they just shoot things or maybe they move back and forth like if they hit a wall they'll go the other way uh stuff like that things that are kind of simple and easy to read and predictable that make platforming kind of a more uh enjoyable and challenging experience i'm kind of lacking on that stuff like i have a lot of enemies that will navigate the terrain and react to what you're doing and try to try to outsmart you and outmaneuver you in a fight. But I don't have a lot of those hazard based enemies, which is fine because they're, I, they're going to be a lot easier to make. Uh, I still need to do traps, things like that. Um, like, uh, spears that pop out of the ground and stuff. I want to do, uh, you know, wall tiles that will shoot, uh, like arrows and things like that. Um, I already have most of the ingredients for that stuff. You know, like there's, I've got all kinds of scripts and code and stuff that I can uh, use for if, you know, the player strikes one of these things or something, maybe you can break it. Uh, Cause I, I have objects that are just breakable blocks and things like that, but you know, I can just make amendments to a new object type that that is a breakable block you know its parent is a breakable block but now this one uh you know has it on a timer will shoot arrows or maybe uh uh proximity you know maybe if the player gets you know x amount of pixels away it'll 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 fire an arrow at him stuff like that um that i already have a lot of the ingredients for and just need uh to do some visuals you know i just need to draw the thing uh and put it in and and sort of give it some extra code so we're we're starting to get to that point where it's like okay what exactly does the game need i've got a fifth of the stages done i've kind of hit a brick wall a little bit with this with this latest boss that i've been working on the uh level design has has come to a halt <laughs> while i finish her um because i'm like oh i i, I forgot i need her she uh i need that boss for this area um but then after that, most of the other bosses I had the foresight to, to finish <laughs> beforehand, so I can plug them into uh, to the new stages that I create. What still needs to be done? Uh, the ghosts and highlands still need to be done. Uh, the the snow area still needs to be built out. Uh, the icy peaks. Um, Black Fen, the sort of dead swamp area needs to needs to be finished. Uh, some the desert area needs to be done and uh, some interesting areas on the red step, which is kind of like Mongolia, <laughs> sort of the game's version of Mongolia. Um, and then like the, the final, uh, the final confrontation. So there are things that need to be done, but I have, you know, the, I've got the goodies to plug everything in, which does feel pretty cool. Like it's like I have uh, a giant bag of Legos you know, and I went through and built each of those bricks. And now I get to take those bricks 
and build something with them, which is a pretty cool experience. Uh, that's that's kind of what that first fifth that I'm talking about was, was being able to look at everything that I had and try to create something interesting with it. And it's and it's starting to pay off. Like, uh, And with within that first fifth of the game, I can speed run it. <laughs> I'm doing air quotes around speed run. Uh, I can get through that in about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half. Um, and by speed run, I mean, I, if I visit every single room, but also don't, don't fucking mess about on the, on the overworld and run into overworld encounters and stuff. If I avoid those and I just play the, the, the critical path stuff that I've created so far and rush through it, go through it as fast as I can, uh, it's about an hour and a half's worth of content, which is kind of cool. I'm I'm right, kind of where I want to be as far as like, um, length goes. Because if I if I create you know five more areas, five or, you know four or five more areas, um, that are about that size, they'll probably be bigger too. Uh, because uh, some of the dungeons need to be a little larger. I I feel like or man, you know what. No, size is not really an issue. And I've learned that from Dark Souls. Like, those games are actually pretty fucking small relative to the time it takes you <laughs> to fucking suffer your way through them for the first time. To learn them. Once you know what to do, uh, you can get through areas pretty fucking fast. Like, you don't even really have to fight everything, surprisingly. You know, there, there really aren't too many... Aside from like boss fights, there really aren't too many areas that sort of force you into a, a mandatory combat situation. Like you can you can kind of sprint and dodge past most things in that game, and there's a there's a cutoff point where enemies won't chase you anymore. Um, but uh, obviously, if you're if you're not like a crazy friggin' Dark Souls Soul Level One speedrunner guy, uh, you're going to be pretty underpowered and not able to to deal with what uh, the bosses are thrown at you same thing with savage too like i'm i'm kind of wrestling with the idea of sort of boxing the player in maybe in certain areas and creating a little arena style fight situation but i don't know i kind of like the idea of leaving it open for the player and maybe providing some ammo for for any anyone who wants to speed run it you know trying to trying to kind of make it speedrunner friendly um maybe maybe i'll have sort of arena like boxed in arena type situations on the overworld map like if you're ambushed um i have designed a few uh overworld encounter maps specifically for that um you know like gates will will pop up or something or like traps uh on a hinge you know will will pop up from the ground and, and block you in and and enemies will sort of like spawn around it and and once you clear the waves, then the then the trap doors sort of go back down, and or trap walls, I guess, sort of go back down. So that, those are those are some, but again, that's that's kind of on a polished path. It's like how can I make the combat a little more interesting and your encounters a little more interesting and varied and different? Because right now uh, on the overworld map, when you run into a random encounter, you kind of just have uh, it can be either one to three rooms in a sequence that's that are sort of randomly put together. Uh, and have enemies spawn based on the the geographic area you're in, what time of day, and like what season, and it'll select the appropriate enemies for that. And you just can kind of run through and like fight them. And sometimes you'll find things like uh, like ore nodes and and trees and stuff that you can get uh, resources for item improvement. Um, and that's kind of about it. Like the the variety comes from essentially where you are in the world map but it might be kind of cool to do certain things like ambushes and stuff like that where you're you're starting in the middle of the room and you're uh sort of you know they got a, like a pincher ambush going and uh, you kind of just have to 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 kill everybody <laughs> to survive so those are those are things i've been thinking about but first and foremost i have to finish the mother of bears boss um, her animal companion, her, uh, Mag, the, uh, the, uh, the avatar of, of the bear god Magdra is all done. Um, but 
I still need to, once I understand her better, the, the mother of bears boss, uh, they need to kind of work together with their move set and their phases and stuff. So that still needs to happen as well. But first and foremost, her art needs to get finished. Her art needs to get done. Um, her layers are all separate because uh, she has a helmet with with horns on it that can be knocked off and and sort of advance her phases in the fight. She'll get more aggressive and and maybe introduce a move that she she didn't do prior uh, to having her helmet on. Um, so yeah, man, that's what I'm working on right now in Savage. Slowly but steadily. Um, but I gotta say, playing through Dark Souls. And more recently, Dark Souls 2 has helped a lot in informing some of my decisions uh, with world building and stuff. Like, uh, not world building, but actual level design and stage design or world design overall. Uh, I don't think I really want to box the player in on the critical path. You know, maybe I just want to leave everything open and... Uh, a, li a little more uh, traversal and sandbox friendly, I think, is what I might go for. Got to commit to that idea, man, whether I'm right or wrong. See, that's why this podcast might be interesting, because <laughs> uh, somebody can go back and listen to maybe how wrong I was. <laughs> or right, you know, maybe maybe if uh, Savage is a, a rousing success, uh, you can <laughs> come back and listen to like what the hell my thoughts were going forward which is kind of a terrifying concept, but uh, there it is, man. Like, you gotta commit, right? You gotta commit to your freaking ideas and uh, you gotta make those choices because otherwise uh, you're kind of stuck doing nothing or a very pale, weak version of a bunch of, a bunch of things, you know, that just never quite hit the mark. So I'm trying to hit that mark in combat, and I'm trying to hit that mark in a in interesting uh, world building and world design. So those are kind of the pillars of the savage experience, I think. So uh, anyway, I haven't been asked any questions <laughs> since since this uh, since I put the first episode up. But uh, I'll, I'll attempt to do a little Q&A anyway because there's always uh, questions that I can mine from previous uh, blog posts and stuff. And, and questions that I get asked in the stream as well. Even though last time, or last week, uh, I didn't do a stream on Friday and this week I didn't do a stream on Monday. I, I've been internally, we're talking about commitment, right? I've been internally committing to trying to do a stream Monday and Friday. But just uh, the way like the allergies were making me feel and shit, I babied out. I pussied out, man. <laughs> I I cowarded my way out of doing a stream uh, on Friday and, and Monday. Sometimes I just don't have the fuel for it, I guess. Um, you kind of have to be in social mode to do that, which I am not always. I can be a pretty dark, grouchy troll of a human being sometimes, and, and that's not really the best uh, version of me to create a, a fun and interesting atmosphere for live streaming. I think. But anyway, uh, what what was I talking about, man? More to the point, I, maybe that's a feature of this podcast is me getting confused and losing my train of thought. We'll call that a feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature. Um, so uh, one of the questions I got asked on my last uh, blog post, not the most recent one, but the one before, and it's a really good question, and it's one that I've uh, been, been thinking of a lot going forward, especially as I'm uh, starting to crank out more music. Um, but Michael Ponder Jr. asks, I think... Or says, and sort of asks, <laughs> I think the music needs to be less 8-bit. It would make sense if the game looked 8-bit, but it looks 16-bit, so why not just take a Genesis sound font, maybe? And here's the thing. Yeah, there, there might be some sort of dissonance between the visual style and how the how I've been doing the sort of chip y music, but... Um, it's just easier. At the end of the day, it's easier for me to do the the super lo-fi stuff, um, but also because I I love that style of music so much, and I, I don't I don't think it's too far off base with how the game looks. Like the game doesn't really try to be eight bit or sixteen bit really in 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 visuals. I mean, I guess it looks like it could be somewhere between. It's like a twelve bit game or something, but uh, um. 
it's just easier to work within limitations that way. If I if I were doing let's say like a uh, Super Nintendo style uh like multiple voices and stuff, the voices being like, you know, stringed instruments and like brass instruments and a whole like a four channel uh percussion <laughs> uh thing. Uh you can kind of complicate it for yourself. And it shows too. Like if you produce a song and you're you're not comfortable with all of your the elements that you're putting into the the into the track, it can sound cheap and stupid and empty in spots. You know, uh, you got to be mindful of like your low end and your mids and your highs and stuff and your 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 uh, sort of central driving melody and uh, like a lead melody or something, and all those kind of have to be paced out and be interesting. Um, you know, you got, you got to have, even just, even in a, a piece of music, you got to have your, your rising and falling action and all that. Um, uh, and to communicate that you use your sounds and stuff. And if you have a whole bunch of fucking sounds available to you and a bunch of channels and stuff, uh, that can get complicated. I can just produce interesting chip tunes a lot faster and I enjoy the hell out of them. There's something about, uh, like especially Sunsoft, man. If you go back and listen to like uh, Sunsoft Batman or the Gremlins soundtrack for for the for the NES games, <laughs> Gremlins and Batman, Sunsoft just really knew what they were doing with with uh, uh, the limited availability of of the NES's uh, sound chip. Um, and it creates a really a piece that has a lot of character. I think those some of the best old chip tunes have a lot of character. And uh, uh, some really interesting texture that you can achieve with some of those sounds too. Um, and just, yeah, just limiting yourself allows you to kind of focus a lot more. And if, if there's one thing I need more of, it's focus and easier ways to do things so that I can produce them faster, but still maintaining, you know, like a, a high quality bar. And I can do that with, with chip tunes. Um, but one thing that I have wanted to do that's on my wish list, and who knows, maybe I'll... And it's just an idea at this point. It's not a promise. It's not anything other than than vapor, <laughs> right? Is it would be awesome to to transcribe the music into a more high-fidelity style. Like, it would be awesome to do, like, you know, a heavy metal kind of version of the soundtrack using actual, you know, my actual guitars and shit and, uh, and, uh, more, more, uh, highly detailed drum samples and stuff like that, you know, an actual, like, like rock or metal drum kit in the background and like a bass line and all that shit. And, you know, some, some keyboard voices and stuff, uh, would be so fucking cool. And it would be even neater in my opinion to be able to offer that as sort of a, a sound option to the player. It's like, hey, you can listen to the chiptune version of the soundtrack while you're playing the game, or you can listen to this more high fidelity version of it and play through it that way. That would be, just be cool. Who knows? Maybe, maybe after the game releases and I, I, I want to experiment with the sound a little more. Maybe I can do a pass like that. Who knows? I don't know. But that's probably going to wrap this up uh, for now. This is Big Giant Head Podcast Episode 2. For no. April 6, 2016. No. No, All y'all are awesome. Hey. Thank you so much for listening. I will catch you on the next Wait. episode and have a great day. Yeah.